Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Faster Masters Rowing Radio. I'm Rebecca Caro, and I'm extremely excited to be here from Auckland, which is just this second gone to level one in our COVID level lockdown. So we've come out of our third lockdown now. So I'm super, super excited. Anyway, this is Faster Masters Rowing Radio, where having a rowing coach only makes you better. Following a program gives you a true pathway to becoming a confident sculler who's respected by your peers. You can become the athlete you want to row with. I'm Rebecca Caro, and I'm joined by Marlene Royal. Hey, hello, Marlene. Ev hello, everyone, and I'm coming to you from the eastern townships of Quebec, where we have moved from the red zone to the orange zone now this week, too. So our situation is improving as well. Well, that's excellent news. And if you're watching live, hello, welcome. Please tell us where you're watching from. Get into the habit. We all know uh, our regulars, and we like to know who's clocking in with us. Because if you don't clock in, we don't know you're there and we don't know it's you. And perhaps tell us what your COVID state is in your local area at the moment, whether you're on the water or whether you're, you know, variously locked up, locked down, locked in, locked out. So our sponsors, we're always really grateful to the businesses that support our podcasting efforts. And the Rowing Retailers Directory, which you can find on rowing.chat, that's the website address, and go to directory on the top menu, has some updates. The Red Boy Row Crew do recycled custom clothes, and they're on the site now. Croker Oars UK, John has spare parts for any croakers, and he can do custom or off-the-shelf builds for you. The Coxswain Academy will help your children get recruited um, for coxing. Exafly is a flywheel eccentric lifting gains product for in the weight room. The oar board gives sand up paddleboard rowing for sea or river. And Whitehall rowing is a traditional rowboat of classic design for ocean rowing. Annabelle Ayres is a rowing artist, and I'm going to be interviewing her actually next week. And she does prints, clothes, and gifts. Bont Rowing Shoes have carbon soles, and they're on the website, as are Ludum, who do performance analysis and club management software. I have three retailers who've all given me interviews. And if you go check them out, you can watch little mini episodes where they talk about their business. Firstly, the San Diego Crew Classic Virtual Regatta. Secondly, the Coffee Corporation, who make the Simulator indoor rowing machine. And lastly, Ready All Row, who do psychology and mental strategy training for rowing. Now. We've got some live viewers. Tony's from the Eastern Townships also, soon to be vaccinated. Oh, well done. And Cece is here from Whidbey on the water when temperatures and winds allow. Obviously, she's on the West Coast, isn't she? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, this past week, this is the part of the show when Marlene and I talk about the broader picture of masters rowing around the world and what we've personally been doing to advocate for masters in the sport. So, Marlene, what have you been up to this past week? Well, this week was um, the Crash Bees, which happened virtually. So I had a number of athletes racing. Um, in in the crash beat events so that was kind of ex exciting to have watching everybody and you know having some people crank out some decent results this week so that that was nice and i think we had a number of faster masters racing as well and um you know it, it was a nice conclusion to the end of our north american winter season so i think everybody um is starting to shift into spring and uh, I had a really nice exchange with a 
very old rowing friend. His name is Wayne, he lives in Connecticut, and he is a rowing poet. And um, Wayne is a very, is very, very well known in the open water rowing world, especially on the East Coast. And he's the founder and organizer of, of a race called the Lighthouse to Lighthouse Race, which is in, in Connecticut. And um, he's also the author of a book called Long Live Rowing and Long Live Open Rowing. And um, so we were we were joking. We connected after a long time. And I said, oh, I, I hope you're listening to our podcast, you know, Faster Masters. We're on every week on every Thursday. And he said, well, do you have a do you have a slower Masters rowing radio? And I said, I said, we have an our I said, our podcast is for all masters, all topics. Anything goes. And um, and I said, oh, well, here's one for you. And, and Rebecca had sent sent this to me. He's like, what's the row slow formula? And I said, short, fat, and inflexible. So I'm like, well, that's the, and I, and he's like, oh, well, how about this? And he, you know, fires me back an email in about 10 minutes. And this is what his response was from Wayne Lysaby of Connecticut. There once was a man who did row. But when older, he found he did slow. So he then did decide he'd go fast on the slide, either that or he'd get him a toe. <laughs> anyway, so we're, we were perpetuating master's poetry this, this week. <laughs> well, that sounds marvelous. And, and, and Wayne, thank you. That was, wow, a, a master of his craft. And let's not Absolutely. go fast on the slide. <laughs> But his book, Long Live Open Rowing, which I think is maybe on Amazon, is full of terrific open water rowing stories. So um, anyone who likes that kind of those kind of tales, um, I hmm. recommend it. I've written that down. Now, yeah. my past week, I have been um, doing a few different things. The first is we're going to have an Oxford Cambridge boat race here in Auckland made up of masters so the old boys and girls have been getting together to get organized and uh, i'm part of the group that's um that's been doing that and that was that will happen i think april the 11th which is boat race day now the other thing is i want to show you a gift that i received from my friend jack's rush and what you can see is i have here on the screen two yellow and black straps with a length of cord joining them together and this is something that Jax has designed because she is shall we say small in the foot department and she regularly finds that getting her feet into the shoes is not a problem but that her feet fall out of the shoes in the rowing boats and she has designed this which is a length of velcro so one bit of it which is around I think six inches long is the spiny bit of the Velcro, which she's actually put some bright yellow canvas on the other side to, to tie it together. And then it joins onto a much longer piece, which is the fluffy bit of the Velcro. Please note, if you want to make this for yourself, that the spiny and fluffy sides must go opposite when they join. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And what you do is you wrap the fluffy bit around your foot and then this, this prickly bit obviously sticks onto it and then you have this neat little cuff that goes around your foot holding your foot in the shoe and of course the quick release cord so that you can pull it should you need to get out of the boat so jacks from wanganui rowing aramaho wanganui rowing club thank you so very much that's just wonderful and I will happily share the dimensions as a recipe if anybody messages me and say, hey, we'd like to make one for ourselves." Oh, that's so handy because that that is that is one of the, the worst things, I think, is to just have your feet swimming in size 12 men's <laughs> shoes. You know what I mean? Like if they're big, really big, that you can wear an aqua sock and put them inside, that's okay. But if there's somewhere in between where you can't really wear an aqua sock and, you know, I mean, and that, and that is a big issue that many masters women are subject to, you know, that's oh, totally. one of those things like huge shoes. I mean, 
It's it's every everyone who buys equipment for a club tends to find a midpoint, you know, a lowest common denominator. And it's a fact of life that we all have different size feet. And some clubs have moved over to these cycle clip type shoes and the vast majority have not. And uh, it's actually as an interesting aside, we approached a local club um, to see if we could run a camp out of their clubhouse. And because they have the cycle clip shoes in every single boat, they can't. Oh. Because the visiting athletes won't have the shoes. And then the shoes are, you know, they're they do cost a bit, you know, they're not yeah. in it, they're not in it. Yeah. Mm. They're not inexpensive. So it is quite an investment. And wow, you know, like who would think that, right? You like they you would think that they maybe they would have an alternative foot stretcher like for example in my guest boat i was telling you about my hudson guest boat i have a i have a hudson guest boat um and i my treat to myself this month was that i i got a, an entire new foot stretcher and new shoes and everything to put into my boat this year but i have an old foot stretcher that has larger has more like a clog type shoe so that if i have somebody rowing whose feet are bigger than the nice new shoes i'm putting in it I can just take the whole foot stretcher out and put that whole foot stretcher in so that I have another opportunity, um, you know, something that's open toed, something like they're like those T vessels, but I just put them into foot stretchers and you, they're real easy to keep clean and wash, but, but people don't feel like they're swimming in them either. Which is really good. Uh, we have another live watcher, Lauren. He is from Gig Harbor, and he rode 6K this morning with blue skies, snowy, flat water, and 34 degrees. Yes, he's out in the Pacific Northwest, too, so he's not far from CC. They, they're, they're on connected water, actually. <laughs> As in, the water goes all the way up the coastline. Well, Puget Sound, right? Exactly. I, so. I'm on connected water. I think you'll find it's the same water that fetches up in New Zealand. I'm if you can row it. far enough, right? You just have to row far enough. You, you won't catch me rowing the Pacific, that's for sure. Oh, I, I've read so many crossing the ocean boats, rowing across the ocean boats. And it's like, I love reading about it, but there's no way you'd get me to do anything like that. No way. I like a shower every day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Me too. Now, my rowing photograph today, this is Matteo Chiaparelli. And he put this awesome picture of him standing on the dock with this amazing pale blue water behind him and a sky which is lightly peppered with cloud. And he has his single resting on his shoulder at this wonderful diagonal uh, angle across the image. And he looks pretty smiley, actually. He, he's, he looks like he's had a great outing, doesn't he? So yes. that's... That looks like Adriatic water. You know, I would say there's got to maybe someplace near Venice or something like that. I'm guessing, but, you know. He sounds Italian. Chiaparelli. Mm. Maybe Trieste. Could be Trieste. Mm. It, yeah. It could just be a very beautiful lake. That's yeah. true, too. There's lots of those. Now, we have been making some videos about Faster Masters, and we just want to treat you to the very first viewing of what's inside a Faster Masters rowing subscription. So this is a super short video, um, and please watch carefully and give me any feedback. Your training program is day-by-day -day instructions on what training to do. Here's an example. Each one tells you precisely what to expect and what the training effort required is. And training builds your strength, your core muscles, your flexibility, and your mobility. Again, these are detailed instructions with video of how to do different exercises in the gym. Peak performance is about sharpening your competitive edge, both in the boat and in your mind. This article is about preparing a 1K race program. Your rowing lifestyle is about recovery, your motivation and your health. Here we talk about how to strengthen your concentration muscle. Technique is a stroke focus with drills to improve your efficiency 
and gain boat speed. A video here is about interpreting force curves. Your bonus is a surprise each month. And when you join Faster Masters, the welcome gift is a detailed presentation about how to adapt your rowing technique with age. There you go. World first, premiere. <laughs> Dig the music, right? Yes. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have another live watcher, Sarah Younger Merrill from Portland in Maine. And that's Abraham, the dog there in the picture. Oh, you know Abraham. I do. He's famous. Uh, oh, is he? Well, he is now. He's been on Faster <laughs> Masters Rowing Radio. We know he's Abs famous. Absolutely. Now this week, Marlene and I decided we're going to talk about some of our favorite technique drills. Now technique, of course, is something that only comes with practice. And one of the key methods of teaching rowing and sculling technique is to break the stroke down into smaller parts and to isolate part of the movement and practice it on its own. And drills have lots of funky and, and fun names, but we thought we'd run through just a couple of what our personal favorites are for our own sculling, not necessarily for, for teaching other people. Marlene, do you want to go first? What's your favorite sweep drill? My favorite sweep drill is rowing with your oarlocks open. And when I am coaching sweep both or doing from time to time, I, I coach sweep camps. And when I do sweep camps, what I like to do is have um, – the boat row by fours. So let's say it's the stern four rowing. And in the stern four, the stern pair will open their oarlocks and proceed normally at a normal kind of easy, low intensity pace, say 18 strokes a minute with the oarlocks open. Um, and this teaches the athletes how to keep their weight into the rigor all the time and how to stay on the path of the arc, to stand their arcs of the oar handle and to keep that constant connection with the boat. And then when the stern pair, I, I have them switch pairs and then I have them go all four oar locks open. So this is really how you can see who is working around the rigor and who isn't. Whoa. Well, you know, you've just inspired me. Obviously, we need to immediately go and practice that in my eight. But Coincidentally, and we genuinely did not tell each other in advance what we were going to pick, my sweep favorite is also a really good drill for making sure that you're keeping your weight into the orlock. So my favorite drill, which can be done all eight uh, or in fours or pairs, is to row square blades with your inside hand holding the backstay. Mm. So what this helps you to do is to get rotation around the arc, particularly from half slide into the catch, because with your outside arm right out to the side of you and you need to hold it pretty much halfway down your backstay, you get a, a normal finish, but it really helps you to get a stronger reach at the catch and to get pivoted more around your oarlock more than you would when you're rowing with with both hands but it's a very good way of showing just how much rotation is possible that's a great drill and you know can i add a little a little nuance to that um another little nuance to that is with the corner of your eye the corner of your eye to the oarlock as you're rotating Okay, and as you're getting closer to placing the blade in the water, try to visualize, try to follow your blade by watching out of the corner of your eye at, as you hold the backstay and rotate. And that really guides, that guides your head to also work around the pin and then your rotation, the torso follows that as well. So that, that's a nice little, just a, a little icing to it, a little addition, but that's, yeah. a, that's, that's a great drill. That's a really, that's I love that drill. Yeah, excellent. Right, let's move on to sculling. So what's your favorite sculling drill? My favorite drill is open fingers 
meaning your fingers are ex your fingers and thumb are extended um and so what you do is once you you tap out and you feather away from your body not into the body you feather once you feather open your extend your fingers and open your thumb and let the or handle sit here right at the base of your fingers and just keep a little bit of weight over the handles so that so that that the handle is like right in that little groove at the base of your fingers and then just kind of spread the tablecloth until it's time for you to square your blade and that, i find that that's just one of the most relaxing exercises and it keeps your weight above the or handles so that helps keep the weight into the pin in the or lock because it's the handles not dropping below the handles and i just find for me, it's one of the most relaxing drills, and I find when people learn that drill, they just kind of go, "Oh, okay, I, I understand where things are now." You know, and it's just just nice connect, nice way to just connect where your body weight is, and that's how you can keep your hands relaxed at and keep the connection to your riggers at the same time. Yeah, we call that one the open palm sculling drill. Mm -hmm. You could you could do it in sweep too, actually. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So my favorite sculling drill is a short slide drill from the catch where you we call it quarter slide push, where you roll all the way out to full slide, put the blades in the water, and then you just roll back one quarter of the slide, which is super short. And if you can, you do this square blades. And the idea is to place the blade in the water before you push, but you only have a really, really short push. So your boat basically gets a sort of pulse and it pulses with one stroke, pulses with the next stroke. And it's very good at helping you to ensure that you're at full compression, to time your placement compared with your drive. And then when I've done maybe 10 of those, then just to scull off normal rowing, and see whether or not my catch and placement, the initiation of the power phase, has been improved. So that's quarter slide push. Yeah, that's a fun one. That's a, that's a really fun one because that timing, I mean, everybody says, yes, of, of, of course you need to put the blade in the water before you start to drive. But how many people don't do it? How many people row the blade in? So it's really important not to row it in, to give that blade a chance to set and then go. Yeah, it helps with that rhythm, you know, because there is a timing there that in set go. It's not in go. It's in set go, in set go, and you can't do that if you don't have the resistance. That's right, exactly. And what you find is after you rode uh, a full stroke or ten full strokes, and then you go back to the drill, the boat's moving really fast because you've been rowing yeah. full slide. And then it's really hard to connect with the water for the first few strokes when you go back to the short slide work. Like, um, <laughs> if you can do this square blades it's best if you can't my suggestion is you start trying to do the drill at half slide or three quarter slide you don't have to go right out to the catch because as daff who he knows who he is he started trying to do this to impress the selectors at a national selection regatta and just flipped that can happen relatively quickly if you're not careful Yes. And this sort of this is the sort of drill that does expose you somewhat if you're not skillful um, and if you're or if you have bad luck and hit a swan or something. Right. It's sort of like dyeing your hair purple. Like you can do that if you're fast enough. Right. So there's certain things you should do if you're fast enough and certain things you should not do. Like the University of Washington. Did you know that the freshman men have to when they join the crew, they have to shave their heads. And you're not allowed to let your hair grow back until you win a race. That's great for their love lives. Yeah, so you going. better win quickly, buddy, right? So <laughs> just step on it, right? Boys in the so boat. I need to know a bit more about this dyeing your hair purple thing. Because if anybody's been to the Faster Masters website, you will see there's a front cover image of a crew. It's a mixed, mixed four. And I'm in the bow seat and I have like a pink streak in my hair it's not quite purple but what's well, the obviously rule you're very obviously you're very fat so we don't worry <laughs> about it <laughs> i've never heard this rule before 
Well, and the head of the Charles and the head of the Charles, one of our traditions, I used to stroke the eight in college, right? So one of one of my traditions was once, because uh, once you cross the finish line and turn around, I had to row back down to Boston University because I rode out of there, which was the starting line. So every year, either I had a gorilla mask or a shark head or something like that, that, you know, so we had to make sure we were a good crew if we were going to, you know, be silly. <laughs> when Tonya and I rode down to the start, uh, when we did the head of the Charles and the Double, uh, someone had given us a tiny little fluffy, uh, a soft toy, uh, which was a kiwi. So we put that in our bow. And that was really cute because lots of people were going, go kiwi! Which was quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the hula dancer, except from down kind under. Kind of like that hula dancer. <laughs> we like hula girl. We do. Cece says, I dye the back of my hair purple for big events in anticipation. <laughs> I think we need a photo of that, Cece. I, I, yes, I demand, yes. I demand to see evidence. Yes, for next week, Cece. That's, that's your homework. <laughs> 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 oh, she says, or for COVID seclusion like now. <laughs> That's too sad. <laughs> now, the next thing we wanted to run through this week is about people rowing in singles. And we know a lot of people, particularly in North America, will be coming back onto the water in the next few weeks, partly because the snow and ice have melted, but also because the COVID lockdowns are easing. How do you get fit? in a single skull if you're new to rowing in a single. So Marlene, you have some ideas I know on how to achieve this. Well, one of one of way that I think is really successful um, is to do combination workouts, meaning um, they could be on the same day, they could be on alternate days of the week. But when if you're first getting in the single and you haven't rowed a lot in the single, it's going to, going to be very difficult for you to get up to pressure to really get um, a workout of any intensity. Uh, you may get tired because you're going to, it's going to require a lot of concentration and drill work and focusing on balance and using different muscles. Um, adjusting for balance and instability that you haven't been using on land. But um, but I always like to use that the technique of doing your hard sessions on the indoor rower and then doing your low intensity and your technique on the water. This way, you're sure that you're keeping your fitness level up as you're getting acclimated to the single. Um, but if you're a new single sculler, it takes quite a while to get to the point that you can really apply full pressure in the single. So um, if it's your first year in the single, you may not want to expect that, quite honestly. Um, I, I think it takes quite a while to get, if you're used to rowing full pressure in a sweep boat or on the erg, it takes quite a while to get that level of technical proficiency in the single. It may even take more than one season. Um, but you can do combination things and, and you may even want to do something like you do some of your hard work on the erg. And then as soon as you finish, you go out in the boat and you do 40, 45 minutes of technique work in the boat. And, and you, you could, you could split your sessions that way or alternate days. Yeah, definitely. And if you get the opportunity, of course, to go in a crew boat, you can work harder because someone else can either sit the boat level for you and you can do power strokes rowing on your own and you can surely exhaust yourself doing that. Yes, yes. Um, now, the other suggestion that I have is if you know you're going to be in the single and you want to at least get a feeling of having achieved something, park your car a long way away from the rowing club and run to the club and then run back to the car afterwards. So it's the same idea as get your fitness on the erg, but you could get your fitness on the land mm -hmm. before and after your sculling session. Because particularly when I was learning to scull, I found that honestly, 25 minutes was enough. Uh, my hands got sore. Sometimes I had, I tended to get really sore arms because I was trying to do too much with my arms and not enough with my legs. And when you get tired, you row badly. And so you're better off doing as high quality as you can for a shorter period 
and then doing something different to get a little bit of cardio in in the same session. Absolutely, because I think one of the things you want to make sure when that you don't want to get to that point, like you said, that you don't want to take bad strokes. And if fatigue starts to set in, that's when your your lower back is going to start to collapse, your posture is going to start to to fail. And that's when you start to set yourself up for little, little, small overuse injuries. So, you know, if you use the motto that you want to go on the water, the next session, the way you came off the water, then come off the water before you start before you hit that fatigue fatigue point and and it may only be 20 25 minutes but if it's 20 25 good minutes then you're going to build up creating good patterns and not not start to establish poor patterns absolutely definitely and remember that only perfect practice makes perfect so doing poor quality strokes embeds bad technique and then you just have to unlearn that and yeah. no coach will thank you for that right and drills are important it's important to do drills that you know there are people who love drills and there are people who poo poo drills but you must if you're going to create a new pattern of blade work or sequencing you must do drills you must do drills but they don't have to be long you could just do five strokes eight strokes and then blend it into your regular rowing. And then again, five strokes, eight strokes, some or three strokes, focus strokes, then blend it back into your into your rowing. But it is very important to work on those individual segments and then blend it into the whole. Um, because you will not change if you're just trying to row steady and then you think, oh, well, I'm just going to try to row a little bit harder. You're not going to create a new pattern. You're going to go back. You're going to revert to the dinosaur pattern. So, yeah. If you don't like doing three stroke drills, you can try doing alternate stroke drills. Mm -hmm. So that could be something like you want to try squaring early or something, particularly for recovery things. It's well worth trying and doing it one stroke than doing maybe one or two not doing it and then come back to doing it again. So that's just an alternative way. That's a fun way to learn to build up pressure. So talking about fitness in the single, you row one stroke, when you, when you feel confident enough, one stroke firm, one stroke easy, two strokes firm, two strokes easy, three strokes firm, and, and you just, you start building up and doing kind of py pyramids like that. And if you get to a certain stroke and you feel like, oh, this is starts to fall apart a little bit, then just kind of stay at that level a bit. But that alternating um, work and, and, and tension-free, okay? I'm not gonna say relaxation as much as not having tension because sometimes when you start to row hard too quickly, you tense up and then that creates, you know, tension on the handle and, things get more, you know, you mess up your blade work and things like that. That's yeah, too true. Uh, yes, I definitely like the idea of using that as a way of building pressure. I often advise beginner scholars that if they have a, a poor stroke and they feel like they have a wobble, it's better to back off on the pressure, get your technique back, and then build the pressure back again. And that might take you three, five strokes to do that. And that's okay. It's, it's far better to get your movement patterns correct before you start working hard. Definitely. And take breaks. You know, just because you're on the water doesn't mean that you have to be moving all the time. You can actually stop and just enjoy where you are for a couple of minutes, rest, give your mind a rest, because te technical work takes a lot of concentration. And you have to, you know, give your mind a break and then start again, you know, press this reset button, have a drink, then start again. Yeah, I particularly like using those breaks for stretching because when I first started sculling, I found two things. My glutes and my hamstrings got really, really tight. Like I would almost fall out of the boat because I, <laughs> yeah, sure. It's a different movement sculling than sweep. And so I would just stop and, you know, reach forward, hold my toes and just sort of hold a, a forward position just to try and do a little bit of stretching. Definitely. Or if it's hot, just put your feet over the edge of the boat and to the cool water. Yeah. <laughs> it feels now, good too. Doesn't that? Yeah. One of our watchers is Alec. Do you want to read this out, Marlene? Sure. Alec, he's a Vermonter. Let's see. I find the coffee erg 
Um, and Rebecca, you mentioned the coffee coffee simulator last week, I believe. It's a the sculling style indoor rowing. It's got two handles and a dynamic um, indoor rower. The coffee erg provides much more realistic single workout than a straight pull erg. Uh, between a coffee and CrossFit, my level of strength, rowing fitness, and holistic strength fitness is great. And as a novice, I don't try to get a workout on the water. Well, the beauty of the simulator is that you can work on those motions that you work on in the boat with arcs around because you have pins and you have handles that overlap. So you can work on all those patterns quite effectively on land, which, you know, really preps you for uh, for, you know, for getting on the water and, and at a much higher level first thing in the season. Yeah, absolutely. And particularly if you do do your workouts on the erg, try and practice the same technique that you do on the water. So if you're an experienced sweep rower, be sure that you are rowing skillfully, that you're not doing the little cheap tricks that we know you can pull on ergs and that you're actually practicing like tapping down on the recovery and uh, not leaning too back, too far back on the finish so that you're actually getting a really good movement pattern together but, and obviously one that is symmetrical, which will definitely help you when you come into the sculling boat. I think that's all we've got time for this week. Any final words before we go, Marley? Well, I would say for the people who are not on the water yet, you know, if even if you don't have a simulate or coffee indoor rower um, and you are on a indoor rower with a straight handle, you can do what I call shadow rowing, which is don't use the ha handle at all and start working on your crossover and your open fingers rowing and thinking about keeping your weight into the rigor. And, you know, you can start just working on those motions um, without the handle, just start working on the patterns and, and, and getting those patterns in your mindset. And um, that is going to help you when you get out on the water, you know, get a mirror set up and start mm. start doing some of those drills on the erg with without handles, just through the hand motions as if you had handles. You can even use your magic markers as handles and practice Quick, your what? practice Quick, your what? crossover. You know, practice, practice all these motions that you need to you need to work on in the boat so that you're ready to do that. I have my magic marker. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yeah. See? We can yeah. both sit there and do oh, our handle right. practice. Yeah. Practice Same your time. feathering and squaring. Same and... sides. Yep, exactly. Give your thumb on the end, Rebecca. Yep. Practice <laughs> your crossover pattern so you're not one on top of the other, one leading. And, and uh, you know, start working on those things. Yeah, that was something in our outing this morning that um, we were a new lineup. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we called for, I call it nesting, so nesting one hand tight behind the other that yeah. really improved the way we were rowing oh yeah because when you're like that look at the difference in the height of your handles versus that that that's an, a big difference in the angle of your oar handles so you do want to that could be one of our one of our fav that's actually my second favorite drill is the mini pause when when you pause and the index finger of your right hand touches the heel of the left hand and you you are trying to level out your handles which then level out the angle of your oars absolutely so this has been faster masters rowing radio for the 11th of march 12th if you're in in new zealand our show is part of the rowing chat network you can get email notifications of our new shows by joining our mailing list which is at rowing.chat and Please tell your friends if you've enjoyed this show, because we really would like to have more people listening and to have a bigger community of masters over the world, all getting together and enjoying our sport more. So this has been Faster Masters Rowing Radio, where having a rowing coach only makes you better. Following a program gives you a true pathway to becoming a confident sculler who's respected by your peers. You can become the athlete you want to row with. Till next time. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Until next week. <laughs>